In lieu of an oral introduction, allow me to introduce somebody who's been keeping us all very busy this past weekend. So Cleo seemed like she was over the novelty of being the only cat and seemed kind of lonely. So we found her a little furry friend. This is Izzy. We found her through a local cat rescue group and she has been amazing. Cleo has been a little Miss Hissy face, which we kind of expected because that's how she's always been. But yeah, hopefully things will settle down soon and they'll get to their cuddling and everything else. But if you hear a lot of kitten noises in the background, Izzy's why. So she'll probably be popping in and out this entire video. Hi. She is also why our little lobster friend is not up on the shelf. I'm not entirely sure where she took it off to. <laughs> Disadvantage of buying a cat a toy, I guess. Hi. Oh, yeah. Welcome back. We are back for another Peterson week. And this week we are starting rule seven, which is pursue what is meaningful, not what is expedient. And there's a lot of Bible stuff, Jung, and some wildlife. YouTube business stuff, speedy version. Like, comment, subscribe. Uh, links for my Twitter, Discord, Instagram, Patreon. Ooh, Patreon. Are all in the description box. And yeah, that's that covered. Refresher for the Peterson video style guide. This is for Peterson stuff, no interpretation. This is me expressing my thoughts and opinions. And this is for the science stuff. It's been a while since we've talked about a Peterson reference in this format, and that's not changing today. Alrighty, let's get to the lobsters while the getting's good. Do we start off this section with A, a lobster, B, a Bible verse, C, a Nietzsche quote, or D, a deep discussion of a dream that Peterson had. If you pick B, congratulations, you are sufficiently harmonized with Peterson and his thoughts. Also, my condolences, you are sufficiently harmonized with Peterson and his thoughts. Life is suffering, that's clear. There is no more basic, irrefutable truth. It's basically what God tells Adam and Eve immediately before he kicks them out of paradise. Peterson then includes a good chunk of Genesis to support this before asking the reader what should be done about this whole suffering issue. Hasn't he answered this question several times already? Rule 1. Get those serotonin hits by standing up straight to shoulder the burden of being, which includes suffering. Rule 2. Deal with life's cruelty by taking care of yourself. Rule 5. Prepare your kids for the suffering of life by not coddling them as kids. This will also reduce your suffering at their tiny hands. Rule 6. Life is suffering, but take insane responsibility for it to improve things. Maybe this book is supposed to be executed like a do-while loop. Do. Keep reading this book until your life is sufficiently unfucked, at which point exit the loop. So people still reading this book haven't been kicked out of that loop yet? Somehow not calling back to Tolstoy's four possible responses to the knowledge that life is meaningless and awful thing from the last chapter, Peterson basically says that the most straightforward thing to do is Tolstoy's number three, hedonism. The way he describes it sounds like nihilistic YOLO. Pursue pleasure. Follow your impulses. Live for the moment. Do what's expedient. Lie, cheat, steal, deceive, manipulate. But don't get caught. In an ultimately meaningless universe, what possible difference could it make? He quotes a chunk of the Bible's Book of Wisdom to support this idea that suffering has been used to justify YOLOing since time immemorial. One line from this passage struck me as very Peterson-y. But let our might be our law of right, for what is weak proves itself to be useless. The rhetorical question of why not YOLO continues on for a little bit before Peterson sets up an alternative. Our ancestors worked out very sophisticated answers to such questions, but we still don't understand them very well. This is because they are in large part still implicit. Manifest primarily in ritual and myth and, as of yet, incompletely articulated. We act them out and represent them in stories, but we're not yet wise enough to formulate them explicitly. 
If this isn't the first Peterson video of mine you've seen, hopefully this implicit explicit thing is sounding familiar. If not, here's a refresher on it before I express my displeasure with this statement. In cognitive psychology, we can make a distinction between implicit and explicit stuff. Learning, memory, knowledge. And when we say implicit, we mean things that are learned without awareness or intent of what's being learned. And the go-to example for this, at least for me, is riding a bicycle. And it's a little bit complicated because, I mean, typically if you're learning to ride a bike, you're trying to learn to ride a bike. But the implicit part comes in in that you're learning all of these motor skills how to pedal, how to steer, and how to stay upright on that bike. And learning these things, you can't just be told and have an explicit trivia thing about how this works. You have to get a sense of it in your body and get those motor programs established to be able to do it. And so that's what we mean without intent. This is why it's difficult to teach somebody else how to ride a bicycle. There are all these implicit motor programs that Unless you're really used to talking about explicitly, you don't really have much access to. And so when you're trying to teach somebody how to ride a bicycle, you're trying to pull up these things and change kind of the code that they're in in your brain. And as I said in the last video, the best you can usually do is to stick the person on the bike and just wish them the best. Explicit things are the things that you can talk about or have access to directly. So these are things that you've learned in a classroom or trivia that you know, memories that you have, you know, things that you can just, yes, I know this thing and here you go. The thing I want to emphasize here is that for both implicit and explicit learning knowledge memory, you have to directly experience these things for yourself. This isn't something we're born with. This isn't something that's an instinct. Those are different. These are things that you have to experience and yeah, we have the hardware and wiring to be able to pick up like language or how to ride a bike or remember what happened last Tuesday, but that's different than being born with this knowledge from our ancestors or something that is sort of implied by Jungian psychology. So he's talking about implicit and explicit things here, but I think he's really talking about the Jungian collective unconscious again. Surprise! Basically, our ancestors were tote smarter than we are in the ways of the world, and their collective knowledge is squirreled away in our unconscious, somehow. We can get glimpses of this knowledge through things like archetypes, but unless you do some serious work, meaning psychodynamic union therapy, you won't be able to access this warehouse of knowledge. Check out my video on Jung for a more thorough explanation of this stuff. Peterson mentions our behaviors and interactions evolving over time, but says that we don't really understand much about their origins or nature. This strikes the recurring theme of us not being able to understand or know ourselves. Convenient that he can. He claims that no one was explicitly shaping our interactions or behaviors. This comment reminds me of part of one of Patton Oswalt's stand-up routines, where he speculates about the origins of religion. So he sets up a scenario caveman times, and you've got the big, strong, brutish cavemen who got to the top of the hierarchy because they can basically beat up anybody else. And you've got Patton Oswald's ancestors who are small and trying to even the playing field. And so what they do is convince the big guys to not beat them up and maybe even give them stuff because if they don't beat up the small guys, there will be sky cake waiting for them when they die. Boom! Religion. One day, however, not so long ago, we woke up. We were already doing, but we started noticing what we were doing. We started imitating and dramatizing. We invented ritual. We started acting out our own experiences. Then we started to tell stories. We coded our observations of our own drama in these stories. In this manner, the information that was first only embedded in our behavior became represented in our stories. But we didn't and still don't understand what it all means. I'm more inclined to go with Oswald than Peterson for how these things got started, if those be my choices. It seems like the order of things is off. Like, why bother with all the effort of doing a ritual if there's no reason, like a story, to be doing this ritual in the first place? I also have a hard time believing that the first people who told these stories had no motive whatsoever in telling these stories. 
why tell the story at all if they're not doing it for some reason? But I guess this would make sense from inside a Jungian perspective. All of this knowledge just floating around in our collective unconscious, if only we had access to it. If only we had some brave, smart, handsome lobster daddy to tell us what these bedtime stories actually mean. Back to the Bible for an example, naturally, although the Jung is less hidden here. The biblical narrative of paradise and the fall is one such story, fabricated by our collective imagination, working over the centuries. Right. The authors of that part of the Bible were working from their collective, uh, I mean, imagination when writing those stories. For some reason, I doubt that biblical scholars would agree that this is the source of them. Peterson recounts his description of the whole Adam and Eve and Eden thing from Rule 2, adding on the thrust of this chapter's argument, the sacrifices of Cain and Abel and later Abraham. After much contemplation, struggling humanity learns that God's favor could be gained and his wrath averted through proper sacrifice. And also, that bloody murder might be motivated among those unwilling or unable to succeed in this manner. How to say this? That last quote seems to be from a Judeo-Christian-centric perspective. All of the world apparently learned from the Old Testament. I thought a huge part of the last rule, set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world, was that those who killed others were expressing their outrage at being, not just having problems performing the necessary sacrifices. Another section starting off with a comment about the section title. Have we fallen into a rut, Peterson? It seems like this keeps happening on the second or third section title in a given rule. How about we spice things up? Maybe the first section next time. Delayed gratification is a concept that's bigger than Freud, but still linked to him. I briefly mention it in my Freud video, but part of the ego's job is to balance the id's base drives with the super ego's saintly view of how we should be. Part of this balance is delaying gratification. It's all well and good to get pleasure now, and that's exactly what the id wants. But that's not always feasible or reasonable. So, the ego needs to learn how to delay the good stuff for when it's appropriate. Last comment before starting the section. This is a weird one. Buckle up, buckos. When engaging in sacrifice, our forefathers began to act out what would be considered a proposition if it were stated in words. That something better might be attained in the future by giving up something of value in the present. The toiling demanded of Adam post-Eden is included as an example of this idea. And basically, he either gets to work now to eat later, or he gets to starve now to die later. Peterson says this idea of work now, benefit later, is why sacrifice is the next thing in the Bible. There is little difference between sacrifice and work. They are also both uniquely human. Sometimes animals act as if they are working, but they are really only following the dictates of their nature. What, and we're not following the dictates of our nature? This is something we'll come back to repeatedly. A big problem I have with this section is he doesn't really define what he means by work, and the amount he flips on the meaning of sacrifice is impressive. Like, he can turn on a dime with it. He's done this before with other words in previous rules, but just the variability for what he means by sacrifice is impressive. Peterson says that work is sacrifice because we are delaying gratification in the process of working. He asserts that the discovery of delayed gratification is equivalent to the discovery of time and of causality. Citation missing. For some reason, I suspect that animals have a conception of time and causality. If you've ever had a furry little friend that didn't free feed, you're probably all too familiar with their ability to know when dinner time is. With regard to causality, all of behaviorism, despite its faults, rests on the ability of animals to learn the relationship, the cause and effect between them doing something and the environment responding. Skinner and Watson and all the other behaviors never would have gotten anywhere and found anything if animals couldn't figure out that pressing a lever or pushing a button resulted in them getting food. Like, animals can understand that they have an impact on the environment, which is causality. He argues that at some point, humans figured out that we could act like reality could be bargained with. Being able to inhibit, control, 
Animals can do this too. And organize our impulsive behaviors, we could help our future selves. He further asserts, without empirical evidence, that this is indistinguishable from organizing society. The act of making a ritual sacrifice to God was an early and sophisticated enactment of the idea of the usefulness of delay. Sophisticated, huh? Sounds more like superstition to me. Coming back to the behaviorist in Skinner, he produced what he called superstitious behavior in his pigeons. And so in a lot of behaviorism experiments, you're trying to measure stimulus-response relationships with time and stuff, and we're not talking about that. In other types of experiments, you are trying to shape their behavior towards a target behavior. And one example of this is, let's say you have pigeons, and you teach them to discriminate between friendly ships and enemy ships that they would see, let's say, if they were in a bomb that was falling towards it and they could correct where the bomb was going. That really happened, by the way. It got scrapped because of the atomic bomb, but it was still a thing they were working on. In another experiment, he was kind of curious what would happen if they weren't necessarily guiding the behavior towards anything. And in this experiment, basically they set the feeder on a timer and saw what the pigeons did. And they found that the pigeons would associate whatever they were doing with when the food happened as the thing that made the food happen. And so you might end up with a pigeon initially doing like a little head movement, like, ah, feeder. Food, sweet, it's the head movement. And eventually you get a little bit of drift where like the head movement isn't really causing the food to happen, but hey, if I do a head movement and then like a little flap, food. So eventually over time, the animals chain their own behavior into this elaborate dance, trying to get the thing to give them food because they believe, not correctly, that they are having an impact in causing this food to happen, whereas it's just random. Am I implying that at some point people made an illusory causal relationship between them doing a sacrifice and being reinforced by the environment? Yeah, I am. Back to Peterson. His version of how things evolved. Eating everything turned into setting aside food for someone who isn't there, which turned into sharing with your future self or others, which is equivalent to short-term storage, which means we need to keep records of who is storing what, which leads to storing money in a bank. I didn't omit a step there. He really does go from recording what food is stored to bank. Our ancestors acted out a drama, a fiction. They personified the force that governs fate as a spirit that can be bargained with, traded with, as if it were another human being. And the amazing thing is that it worked. I think it would be more fair to say that it didn't not work. Doing this superstitious behavior didn't get us killed off, and so it wasn't selected against. Since I'm not an anthropologist or sociologist or any of the those types of ologists, you're not going to get a deep dive on the origins of sacrifice from me. However, Encyclopedia Britannica has an interesting entry on sacrifice. The basic gist I'm getting from it is that it's thought that a big part of doing some sort of sacrifice for a lot of groups was building relationships within the community and with the deity. It's also pointed out that trying to account for all types of sacrifices with one theory is nigh impossible, as there were always groups doing it slightly differently or trying to meet different goals. Here's a productive symbolic idea. The future is a judgmental father. That's a good start. But two additional archetypal foundational questions arose because of the discovery of sacrifice, of work, both have to do with the ultimate extension of the logic of work, which is sacrifice now to gain later. The first question is, what are we going to sacrifice? Peterson notes that small sacrifices might work for small problems, with no clarification of what a small sacrifice or a small problem might be. He says that larger problems will require larger sacrifices. His example here is of an undergraduate having to sacrifice the fun party lifestyle in order to go to med school and become a doctor, with the payoff here being that some time down the road you're going to get the fat doctor paycheck. So his answer to this first question is sacrifices are necessary and to go big or go home. The second question, we're told, is actually a set of questions. 
He asserts that we've established that doing a sacrifice will make the future better. Have we, though? I don't think we have. The set of questions basically boil down to what is the best possible sacrifice and what will the return on investment be? The biblical story of Cain and Abel, Adam and Eve's sons, immediately follows the story of the expulsion from paradise, as mentioned previously. Cain and Abel are really the first humans, since their parents were made directly by God and not born in the standard manner. So I'm sort of cutting Peterson off here, and we'll get to the rest of the argument in a second. First, see what I mean about the attempts at couching the biblical stuff becoming less convincing, or even present at all? I mentioned in a previous video that these having your cake and eating it statements were seemingly having less effort put into them. Now it's not even here. Second, the confused Pikachu in the corner continues to be reinforced as a very good choice of avatar for how I feel reading this stuff. The first humans? Right. Okay, so because Kin and Abel are in their situation, they have to make sacrifices to keep Sky Daddy happy. And Kane fucks this up. Which indicates that not all sacrifices are of equal value. As such, it's only natural to ask, why are some sacrifices valued more than others? What pissed God off? And Peterson says that we ask these questions all the time, even if we don't realize we're asking them. How convenient. We're doing things we don't even know we're doing. It's a good thing that we can trust good old Lobster Daddy to know the darkest corners of our mind. Asking such questions is indistinguishable from thinking. I thought part of the thing from the last rule was that we needed to follow our beliefs and not question where they're coming from. I guess this is something that's safe to think about. Long quote is long, but I'd hate to deprive you. Plus, I'm gonna nitpick. Subscribe for more picking of nits. The realization that pleasure could be usefully forestalled dawned on us with great difficulty. It runs absolutely contrary to our ancient, fundamental animal instincts, which demand immediate satisfaction, particularly under conditions of deprivation, which are both inevitable and commonplace. And, to complicate the matter, such delay only becomes useful when civilization has stabilized itself enough to guarantee the existence of the delayed reward in the future. If everything you save will be destroyed or, worse, stolen, there is no point in saving. It is for this reason that a wolf will down 20 pounds of raw meat in a single meal. He isn't thinking. Man, I hate it when I binge. I should save some of this for next week. So how was it that those two impossible and necessary simultaneous accomplishments, delay and the stabilization of society into the future, could possibly have manifested themselves? We'll get to his answer to this question in a second. First, let's talk about leopards. Leopards hunt alone. As such, they've had to be crafty in how they take down their frequently larger prey. Part of this craftiness is tied to what other predators they share the space with. If there are larger predators, like lions, they'll tend to kill only what they can drag up a tree for storage, so they can eat later. What some might call planning for the future. Maybe even doing a sacrifice. So leopards are relevant here. They hide their kills so that other animals can't come along and steal their work. They hide it so they have something to eat later. And it just so happens that doing this behavior has conveyed a survival benefit that just leaving it out in the open didn't offer. Wolves tend to have a different strategy than leopards. They tend to hunt in a pack and are therefore able to take down larger prey animals than themselves, which results in a lot of meat. This meat is shared among the pack, and assuming the meal is a large one, all the wolves will get their fill. And they don't know when their next meal will be, so they gotta eat up now. But wolves can also apparently do some extra work for later gain. It's been argued that surplus killing is actually a form of the wolves taking an easy or rare prey item they have access to now, so they can return and eat more at a later point. So no, Peterson, a wolf can say, I'm good, I'm done eating now, and come back to it later. Let's get back to letting Peterson answer that question of his. Honestly, not paraphrasing Peterson results in a lot more back-end work for me in producing this video. But there are some things I don't want to paraphrase and reduce the impact of. Here is a developmental progression from animal to human. It's wrong, no doubt, in the details. But it's sufficiently correct for our purposes in theme. First, there is excess food. Large carcasses? 
Mammoths or other massive herbivores might provide that. We ate a lot of mammoths, maybe all of them. After a kill with a large animal, there is some left for later. That's accidental at first. But eventually the utility of for later starts to be appreciated. Some provisional notion of sacrifice develops at the same time. If I leave some, even if I want it now, I won't have to be hungry later. That provisional notion develops to the next level. If I leave some for later, I won't have to go hungry, and neither will those I care for. And then to the next. I can't possibly eat all of this mammoth. Maybe I can't store the rest for too long either. Maybe I should feed some to other people. Maybe they'll remember and feed me some of their mammoth when they have some and I have none. Then I'll get some mammoth now and some mammoth later. In such a manner, mammoth becomes future mammoth and future mammoth becomes personal reputation. That's the emergence of the social contract. Oh dear. Or should I say, oh mammoth. Let's start by talking about us and mammoths. So yes, historically, we have tended to like hunting the megafauna, whatever it might be, like mammoths. And you can kind of see why. It's a huge meal just sitting there. So historically, you'd have a group of people, typically guys, go out, find the prey item, do their thing. And as long as the hunt was conducted smartly, there was a minimal risk of getting injured. Bada bing, bada, whatever noise arrows and spears make, and you got yourself and your family, maybe tribe, a pretty good meal for a while. It's unclear if we were the killing blow for mammoths or if something else did it, like the climate up and changing. I have to completely disagree with Peterson's wrong but sufficiently correct explanation of things. For one, especially historically, a person does not take megafauna down on their own. That's why they're mega. Lions certainly don't. It's a team effort. And that team will expect to be given access to the reward hierarchies and all. For two, food preservation is a luxury. That's what you do when you have enough, even if just barely, and you don't want the surplus to go to waste. Finally, is he saying that trade is roughly equivalent to the social contract and therefore society? Because that would mean that there's been some form of society for at least 300,000 years. I'm not saying that this couldn't be the case, but I'm not sure that this is quite what he was intending. The concern I have for all this telling of stories he knows to be wrong is what's called a source monitoring error. A source monitoring error occurs when you have a memory, but you don't remember the source of that memory. So you heard a piece of information, the original source of where you heard that piece of information is gone, and at that point, several things can happen. One is that the source could just be left as unknown. Especially if you're familiar with this, you could get in the habit of memories that you don't have the source for, get a little flag of source unknown, doubt veracity of this until you figure out if it's true or not. You could also have this memory, or piece of information let's say, with an unknown source. It sounds reasonable, and you're smart, you've done a lot of reading, you have whatever degree you have, it sounds about right. It's, it's probably true. It's, it's fine. Or in this story's case, the source itself, meaning Peterson and 12 Rules for Life, could be remembered, but you could forget the critical detail that he pulled it out of his ass. And if you're likely to see Peterson as a credible source, then you're likely to think that pretty much anything that came out of this book is true. And that's, that's not good. Peterson pulling a harmless story out of his ass could lead to some of his readers remembering this story is true. Peterson says that sharing is equivalent to trading. To share does not mean to give away something you value and get nothing back. That is instead only what every child who refuses to share fears it means. To share means, properly, to initiate the process of trade. A child who can't share, who can't trade, can't have any friends because having friends is a form of trade. Here he goes with friendship as the transactional thing again. He continues to expound the benefits of sharing, building up to a point that having a reputation as a good sharer is a good thing to have. Then, apparently, the concepts of reliability, honesty, generosity can be worked out, which can then serve as the foundation for morality. We can see in this manner how from the simple notion that leftovers are a good idea, 
the higher moral principles might emerge. That seems like a bit of a reach altogether there. You ready for an evolutionary psychology fairy tale? It's as if something like the following happened as humanity developed. First were the endless tens or hundreds of thousands of years prior to the emergence of written history and drama. During this time, the twin practices of delay and exchange began to emerge, slowly and painfully. Then they became represented in metaphorical abstraction as rituals and tales of sacrifice told in a manner such as this. It's as if there is a powerful figure in the sky who sees all and is judging you. Giving up something you value seems to make him happy, and you want to make him happy, because all hell breaks loose if you don't. So, practice sacrificing and sharing until you become expert at it, and things will go well for you. And this is all true whether there is or is not actually such a powerful figure in the sky. No one said any of this, at least not so plainly and directly. But it was implicit in the practice and then in the stories. It's as if this happened? Such a fucking cop-out. Of course Peterson's sky daddy would, one, be a daddy, and two, be a judgmental ass. As indicated previously, the origins of doing sacrifice varied between the different groups doing it. Sometimes it was to bring the community together because the sacrifice itself was consumed by the group. Sometimes the sacrifice was to get brownie points with your sky boy. Yeah. Sometimes you did it because everything's on fire. Oh my god, please make it stop. Someone had to have said something about some sort of intangible reason to kick off the sacrifices. I can't imagine our ancestors just miming like... because they were too embarrassed to say that they wanted to destroy a bunch of stuff. Also, to do a little bit of evolutionary fairy telling of my own, it seems like the stories would have had to have come before the actual ritual sacrifices. Even if it was something like, Hey Bob, did you notice how after we had to kill that one goat, the weather was really nice for a little bit? I wonder what was up with that. Finally, recall that complaint I made earlier about source monitoring errors? Apply that here, too. Action came first, as it had to, as the animals we once were could act but could not think. Implicit, unrecognized value came first, as the actions that preceded thought embodied value but did not make the value explicit. People watched the successful succeed and the unsuccessful fail for thousands and thousands of years. We thought it over and drew a conclusion. The successful among us delay gratification the successful among us bargain with the future. The successful sacrifice. Rapid fire response, go. Animals can fucking think. Circular definition of success is circular. This last part is not universally true. Imagine, if you will, someone who is in a very high position of power. This person has demonstrated themselves to be incredibly short-sighted and reactive. They were born on third base, but not only would they swear that they hit a home run, but they have the best battings of everyone. They probably also bought the stadium and own the team. Of course, I'm talking about a real person that many of us wish would just stop, at the very least. And for those of us who do wish him to stop, would you say he's much of a delayer of gratification? I don't think so. There's a quote by Bill Gates that he'd choose a lazy person to do a hard job, because a lazy person will find an easy way to do it. Recent Bill Gates comments aside, Oh, I have too much money and I can't possibly donate it fast enough, so meh, why try? Anyways, in this case, it sounds like success, meaning being a lazy, smart programmer trying to avoid work, and being successful, presumably because of that, means that they're avoiding work and are therefore avoiding sacrifice. By the way, we're still on this question of what's the best possible sacrifice, and Peterson assures us that shit's about to get real deep here. The biblical god requires sacrifice. Well, required? I guess it depends on what flavor of Judeo-Christian you are. But anyways, that sacrifice might be what you value most. And then we're given the Peterson version of the Abraham almost had to sacrifice his son, but then was saved at the last minute by an angel swooping in thing. The story ends happily. That's a good thing. But it doesn't really address the issue at hand. Why is God's going further necessary? 
Why does he, why does life impose such demands? I think the going further part is about God wanting Abraham to suddenly and unexpectedly kill his son, I think. We're interchanging God with other things again, this time life. So apparently having your cake and eating it is back in season. Peterson's analysis of this issue is opened by what he calls a truism. Sometimes things do not go well. Sometimes when things are not going well, it's not the world that's the cause. The cause is instead that which is currently most valued, subjectively and personally. Why? Because the world is revealed to an indeterminate degree through the template of your values. If the world you are seeing is not the world you want, therefore, it's time to examine your values. It's time to rid yourself of your current presuppositions. It's time to let go. It might even be time to sacrifice what you love best so that you can become who you might become instead of staying who you are. I really get the sense that he didn't write these rules in a particular order. We've been told in many different times, in many different ways, that things going poorly, it's our fault. And I feel like if he had written these to go in a particular order, rules would build on each other and they wouldn't feel so disconnected. If the world you're in isn't the world you want to be in, check your values, sacrifice what you love best for growth. Holy shit, dude. I would like a world where people are free to be who they want to be, as long as it's not hurting the rights of others, including animals. Dogs can't consent. So none of that. But I don't think there's anything wrong with my values. I legitimately think that the world should be more accepting and accommodating of people. How is getting rid of my assumptions or sacrificing what I love going to accomplish that? Or is the point of this that I may become a bigot instead of staying a progressive? <sighs> There's a recounting of a story about catching monkeys by putting a bunch of treats or something that they want in a heavy jar. Monkey goes in to grab, won't pull its hand out, so all you have to do is walk up and just grab the monkey, apparently. Um, can't say I leave things out in these reviews. In something that feels like a prosperity gospel sales pitch, Peterson says that giving up something valuable ensures future prosperity. His examples here are a choice cut of meat, a prized flock animal, your foreskin, but he's still asking what the ultimate sacrifice would be. His answer is that it's a close race between child and self. His explanation here includes, surprise, the Bible. He says that Mary knowingly and voluntarily brought Jesus into the world knowing that he would be later sacrificed. First, it's just a story, but from my reading of the Annunciation, it doesn't really sound like Mary had much choice. It seems more like some angels showed up, told Mary that this was going to happen. She was like, but I'm a virgin? And the angel was like, nah, God'll do it, it's fine. So she was like, I am the Lord's servant. Where is her choice in any of this? Jesus does his Jesus stuff, gets crucified. Peterson says, This is the archetypal story of the man who gives his all for the sake of the better, who offers up his life for the advancement of being who allows God's will to become manifest fully within the confines of a single mortal life. That is the model for the honorable man. In Christ's case, however, as he sacrifices himself, God, his father, is simultaneously sacrificing his son. It is for this reason that the Christian sacrificial drama of son and self is archetypal. He really bookended that archetype stuff on this part really wants us to understand how archetypal and profound this is. But is this sort of writing really all that compelling for people who aren't already on board the Jesus train? It's like chick tracks. They assume that non-believers just need to hear and learn about Ah Lord and Savior Jesus Christ! And that we'll drop to our knees and profess our new faith. I have a story I want to tell at some point about a student who tried to have this sort of moment with me. Maybe I'll schedule it for Christmas. On that note, something that's never made sense to me. Why did God have to have his son killed? He's omnipotent, omniscient, omni whatever. Why couldn't he step in at some point before the nails are being driven in to say like, oh, nope, you proved your point, you got it, it's all good. To be heretical, is it because the leader of a cult got killed, so they had to work that into the narrative somehow? 
make it central to the belief that he died, but it was totes okay because he for reals resurrected, but sadly had to leave before being seen by non-believers? I was only going to include the initial part of this quote, but as I was going through it, I felt like I couldn't do it justice. Pain and suffering define the world. Of that, there can be no doubt. Sacrifice can hold pain and suffering in abeyance to a greater or lesser degree, and greater sacrifices can do that more effectively than lesser. Of that, there can be no doubt. Everyone holds this knowledge in their soul. Thus, the person who wishes to alleviate suffering Style madness repetition of this idea, seriously, like, he says it five different ways. Will make the greatest of sacrifices, of self and child, of everything that is loved. To live a life aimed at the good. He will forgo expediency. He will pursue the path of ultimate meaning. And he will, in that manner, bring salvation to the ever-desperate world. See what I mean about him playing fast and loose with sacrifice? Is he talking about a literal sacrifice here? Other than equating it with work in some places, the only concrete forms he's talked about sacrifice is on the altar varieties. I'm sure if I pointed out that not everybody believes we have souls, I would be told to stop reading this so literally. Of course he meant a figurative soul. Whatever would have given me the impression that he was talking about a literal soul. So, you know how it tends to be a red flag if you're becoming associated with a group and that group wants you to cut all ties to friends and family who aren't a part of that group, and maybe lose your attachments to material possessions, or if that group is promising you the answers to life, or could have the belief that this group is going to save the world, these things that could indicate that that group is a cult? Yeah. I think we'll leave off on this chapter on that thought. See you next week!